Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having us. I'm Roland Petrello from the Communication Studies Department. I'm Silva Union, the Access Coordinator. And we each had separate opportunities this past summer to travel to South Africa and tour around so that it ties into the One Campus, One Book this year is a very happy coincidence. And we're here to hopefully share some of our experiences in South Africa as they connect to the book. And starting us off is going to be Silva. Thank you, Roland. So as we begin the trip, I was listening to the book um, on my, my travel there on the airplane. And I went, I flew into Johannesburg and then we drove around through the safaris, went down to Durban and then flew over to Cape Town. So I will mention a few different towns and give you try to perspective give you perspective I had of different areas of South Africa. But as I begun my journey, this isn't working. It was working up until this moment. Um, my first encounter was actually with Tyrone Pele. Tyrone Pele was sitting near me, and he is a Paralympian. He was coming back from the United States. He works with Toyota, and he works with, with he comes out here, he works on the tracks, and he works with an organization that helps um, younger athletes who are missing limbs practice. And he, he's a, um, he was sitting next to me, and then on the other side of me was a lady who was a political psychologist. So I got two very different perspectives from what the both of them shared. Um, the political psychologist was sharing a lot about her work after the apartheid. And one of the biggest things I took away from her was the food is so good. So there is a, <laughs> there is a lot of things unshared um, or kept. And then when Tyler stood up to shake my hand, the lady said, are you Indian? And that's when I noticed the tension. And he immediately said, no, I am a South African. And that need to kind of come back to your own country and let your people know that you're from that country really jump, jumped out at me. And then on the other side, you have a, a Zulu tribesman. So I had learned about Zulu. I had read about Zulu. I had known them as warriors. Um, but then when I was... I was somewhere where our waiter was Zulu. I kept talking to the waiter and he kept looking away and I kept trying to make eye contact. I kept asking questions. And the manager of the restaurant came over and said, you know, they're actually very modest people and he's trying to be respectful to you by not speaking louder than you and not looking at you in your eyes. So what I read and what I was going into and experiencing was very different. Um, there was KFC everywhere, so a lot of American influence in different places that you went. And then also there was a lot of political science. It was a time of, of voting for a new presidency. So depending on what region we were was dependent on who they were supporting or who, who, which signs I saw the most of. It was hard to capture a lot of pictures of just the road and the people because you have to stay in your car. It's not suggested to park, to get out. Um, you're always in motion. So a few good shots I got passing by. Um, as you can imagine, not a lot of pavement everywhere the way we had here, but still spectacular highways. I, I was very much impressed at how developed a lot of the places are, especially for a tourist, right? And then you have the acacia trees. And of course, where we were there, we read a lot about how much trash is in Africa. So sadly, it's beautiful and you look out, but then there's a, um, a lot of trash. And then you see a bus converted into a mobile library. So it's just like different worlds happening at the same time. Oh my. And this was most of our traffic. And it's just stunning to be on the road and you wonder, am I gonna see an animal? And you lean very heavily on Vance, Vance Manicus, our athletic director, to spot all the animals for you because he's, he's just, he's the best at it. But then the animals just come over to you. And, and that experience, you know, they're also curious. They wanna know who's this person. 
and what we have there is the African smile. So a lot of times you don't really get to see their faces, but you certainly get to see their tails. <laughs> One of the things in the book was talking about uh, the different influences from missionaries, from learning English, from English colonization, then Dutch colonization, and you see that when you ask for the names of things, that they will give you an English name. So this they call the fever tree. And it gets its name because when European settlers went, they would camp underneath the tree. And the trees were closer to swamp areas. And they would get bitten by mosqu mosquitoes and get malaria. And they imagined that it was the tree that was giving them fever. And so just another way of which in their country, they were using European terms to explain things to us. Oh. Okay. When I reflected on my experience traveling this summer, I, I realized that most of my experience had to be contextualized that when I got to go, and I went a couple weeks after Silva and Vance and Sharon and Jennifer and her husband got back, I traveled with my 10-year-old son. And so everything that I experienced in South Africa, I found myself experiencing through the lens of a 10-year-old trying to understand everything that he was processing. And what that enabled uh, for me to do is to have some amazing conversations with my son. And I realized, first of all, he is way smarter than I am <laughs> and way more observant. It, it allowed me to realize that there are so many, well, there are so many differences between here and where we live and the environment which he has been being raised in there are also way more similarities that I found than, frankly, most of us would care to admit there are. One of the things that we spent most of our time at a safari camp up near Durban. And it was when we, when we purchased the trip at the auction, that was the safari camp we were going to be at. And certainly we'll talk later about the animals because South Africa was my bucket list trip. I have wanted to go to Africa and be able to photograph animals for decades now. But one of the things that really struck me when I was traveling around with my son as we went to another national park and we went to other places was the houses and the way others were living. And it, it really struck me. I read Trevor Noah's book after we got back. And one of the things that he talks about there is that what people would build onto their houses one room at a time to accommodate the growth of the family, et cetera. And my son, I remember the first time we passed by a group of these houses on the side of the road, and he commented that they were shacks. A very different perspective. And some of them were multi-room homes that Trevor Noah is talking about in that region were signs of wealth in that community. But to my son, compared to where we live, they were shacks. They were things that, corrugated metal as a building material is not anything that he's ever experienced here. And Trevor Noah talks about it being such a large part of his experience growing up. And that enabled me to talk to my 10-year-old son about the notion of privilege and the idea that we are very fortunate that we happen to have been born here in America, in California, in a very different environment that Trevor Noah grew up in. And he talks a great deal about his poverty. And for us, while we are, you know, as a teacher, ensconced in the middle class here in America, there is another layer of privilege, not just in terms of where we've grown up, but the amount of money we have and the luxuries that we have to have a car to travel. One of the things that struck both of us as we were traveling around is how many people were hitchhiking. Now, as someone who came to school in Moorpark College in the decades ago, <laughs> there were many times that I took the bus to get here. And if I missed my bus, I never worried because I had a thumb and I could hitchhike. And that was an era when people pitch, picked up hitchhikers all the time. Now, people wouldn't even dream of picking up a hitchhiker. It's dangerous. They're going to be a serial killer. But in South Africa, we saw people hitchhiking all over the place. There was a, there was a comfort, there was a trust, 
uh, that was there. And that was one of the first conversations that my son and I got to have contrasting the differences between where he is growing up and there. And the majority of the conversations, we had a wonderful experience when we went to Johannesburg. One of the things that I made sure we did, and it was a highlight of the trip, I think, for me and for him as well, is we went to the Apartheid Museum in Soweto. Now, where we were staying in South Africa, in Johannesburg specifically, was a very, very affluent area. The hotel we were in is, frankly, the nicest Marriott I've ever been in my life. And it was also the least expensive Marriott I've ever been in my life, which was a wonderful combination. But one of the things about staying in that hotel is we had a private driver and a car service that drove us wherever we wanted to go. And he was a member of the Kosa tribe, which Trevor Noah talks about the difference of Kosa and Zulu, and I'll come back to that. And he drove us to the Apartheid Museum, which was about a 45-minute drive from where we were staying. And one of the things that we talked about is he said the area that we were staying in was one of the most affluent suburbs of Johannesburg. He described it as the Jewish sector. How did I know it was affluent? The, walking, the Lamborghini dealership that was walking distance from a hotel was a good sign to me that we were definitely in a very affluent area. And why did that st strike me? Because the houses, what we could see of them, were beautiful houses in the area. But they all were surrounded by 20-foot walls. And at the top was, he explained, not just razor wire, but electrified razor wire because of the violence and the poverty in South Africa that these were affluent individuals that wanted to remain very protected, which continued our conversation about privilege. But then we went to the Apartheid Museum and we spent about three hours there. And I have to say that if you ever get to go to South Africa, allot yourself way more than three hours at the Apartheid Museum because there was so much to see there and so much that tied in for me to what Trevor Noah talks about in his book. One of the things that we encountered in the Apartheid Museum was a great deal of film history of the era of apartheid. And I remember we were sitting there and we were watching it and I forgot who I was with, that I was with my son and we were watching film that included white police officers, white military, beating and killing black African citizens. And in these old film clips, it's very dramatic, obviously, because it's real. And I was sitting there for about 10 minutes, and I realized my son was sitting right next to me. So I looked at him and said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing fine, Dad. And he wanted to keep watching it. And I began to cons become concerned over what he was watching. And even though Trevor Noah talks about it, I wasn't sure that a child was ready to watch this. And he said the most amazing thing. And this is where I really said, you know, there are a lot of similarities here. One of the things that he said to me that will always stay with me is, it's okay. It happens where we live too. And that was one of those moments where we began to connect the dots. And as I... As I read through Trevor Noah's book, I began to see so many places. What were some of the other things that really struck? In the Apartheid Museum, you begin to get the history of Apartheid, and it's the same history that Trevor Noah talks about, but you see it in photographs and you see it in maps. And one of the things that it talked about is how and why Apartheid came to exist. And this notion that if you could pit groups against one another, for example, he talks a lot about the conflict between the Kosa and the Zulu, and that that was capitalized on his books. And if you could just pit those groups against one another, they became much easier to manage. The book talks about, it, and we saw it, and once again, then having the conversation, how different is that from where we live and pitting groups against one another? We probably live in one of the most polarized times in our country's history politically, and we begin to see those same things that tore South Africa apart and plunged it into an era of apartheid that happened here and begin to make those connections. One of the things that really struck me and would not have picked up from the muse museum is Trevor Noah talks about that language bias 
And it was really interesting hearing the different languages that were around us. When we were in Durban, the predominant, I mean, we were at a camp called Zulu Nayala. So obviously the predominant tribe and the predominant population there were Zulu. When we were in Johannesburg, the majority of the people that we came in contact with were Kosa. And the language, and the language is beautiful. There's, I, I wish I could learn languages because it was just this melodic quality to the languages that were so foreign to me but sounded beautiful to listen to. But even the language bias and one language being better than the other and that stratification. And once again, even though it's about the book, I came back to that notion even here in America. And my son talked about it, is how comfortable are we when we are out shopping or when we are in a retail space and we begin to hear languages that are not our language in the way that we react. And one of the things I talked about and we looked at on YouTube, and we've probably all seen the videos of somebody who gets upset in line at the store or at a restaurant when they hear someone speaking another language. And I'm struck by how much we use, even here, that language to divide groups much as Trevor Noah talks about in his book. And that really comes through in the Apartheid Museum and that experience that he talks about. Of course, then there is an entire wing of the museum. As we've gone through the history of all of this, there is an entire wing of the museum dedicated to Nelson Mandela and his life. And I know Silva will talk in a little bit about getting to go to Robbins Islands. But one of the things that struck me is the way he was able to navigate not just his own liberation, but the liberation of his people. And one of the most enjoyable was when he was talking about what we now know from the movie Invictus and that rugby match. And when South Africa began to come together, and ironically, it began to come together because of sports. And the rugby team that the entire nation could get behind and the leader, and I, for, I forgive me, I forget the, the leader of that or the captain of the team who invites Mandela out and it's Mandela as now the leader of South Africa and this white rugby player. And it was seeing them together and seeing South Africa win this sporting match, where the, which they were not favored to win, that really begins to knit the country together. So you have these things that separate, pitting one group against another and one language against another. And it was only when there was that commonality of sports that they began to set aside all of those differences and come together. And once again, that, the, the conversations that we were having. We are very fortunate, we came away saying, with the privilege that we have being here in America the affluence that we have, the environment that we are able to grow up in. And frankly, I'm very pleased. The environment I get to raise my son in is so fundamentally different than South Africa. But the issues that they face, the issues that Trevor Noah talks about in his book, are not all that different than the issues that so many of us are familiar with. And connecting those dots was a very powerful experience for me. And as I said, I didn't get to see Robbins Island, but I know you did. So if I'll, I'll let you come back up and share Thank a little bit you. about that. Before I get into Robbins Island, though, I want to share <clears throat> a few other excursions we went on because South Africa is such a beautiful place and it has um, both oceans, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean facing it. It has terrain that's just incredible to, to navigate. I didn't go on a hike. Um, but I saw the pictures from the hike and the mountaintops, and it's gorgeous. And then, of course, we'll get into the animals, too. But I am going to say I was very lucky to have gone in a group because a lot of things were very scary. Um, and I don't know how much of it I would have experienced if I didn't have my group mates with me. Um, believe it or not, ordering food <laughs> at a particular place was quite challenging. No one spoke English there. And it, it wasn't traditionally you sit down or at least you go to a countertop. It was more like a, I kept calling it a food bazaar. You know, people were moving around. There were multiple menus. People didn't speak English. You weren't sure where you ordered, where you paid. And then you got these aluminum trays of food. And you're like, well, we think this is what we ordered. And it could be our tray. So let's just grab it, sit down. It was very communal. Everybody sat at the long tables. People came with their families. 
there are multiple languages going on at that place. Um, so that was our adventure, trying to eat somewhere that wasn't touristic. Um, and all the food was really good everywhere we went. And of course, you can't, you can't go to Cape Town without tasting some wine. Um, and that is a winery that is uh, connected to Stellenbosch, some of the oldest wineries. And they, they even shipped wine to Napoleon while he was in prison. That's how important their wine is um, and also quite tasty. And some of the, the shops we went into, lots of beautiful, beautiful um, artifacts. Some of them really ancient. They, you could tell that they had somehow, I don't know, maybe they went on an excursion, they buried it out, it, it was fossilized. Um, and then you always, always saw a picture of Nelson Mandela, of course. And I wish it wasn't so heavy and I had room to, for my suitcase, but the gentleman you see there that's sitting down, he was made of bronze and he was probably uh, six foot tall. So uh, amazing work. And then some of the adventures you can have. Um, we went uh, the Atlantic side. Again, luckily I went with friends because a lot of things are quite terrifying if you're alone, but it seems to be a lot more fun if you're going together. Um, we went and swam with, with sharks. We saw two copperheads and a great white shark. And I think Jennifer pointed out that she even made eye contact with one of the great white sharks. So um, they are not interested in eating you unless you're wearing one of those suits and you look like a seal. So, The scariest part, I will tell you, was how cold the water was. Other than that, you're just having the time of your life. So we couldn't talk about South Africa um, without going back to, to a place that was one of the most important um, locations that we visited. And I want to read something from the book um, Trevor said. He said, in America, you had the forced removal of native onto reservations coupled with slavery followed by segregation. Imagine all three of those things happening to the same group of people at the same time. That was apartheid. Before we got onto the boat to go to Robbins Island, you got to watch a film and then you walked through and you looked at photos and you saw the chronicle, chronological order and which things had happened and you, you read the visuals. And, and just as he said, it, it all happened at the same time. People were enslaved, people were separated, people who could come back had to live separately, they were segregated. This gentleman was in prison at the same time as Mandela. So now, the people who were imprisoned there are the same people that walk you through the grounds, are the same people that share what it was like to live there, the beatings that they received, the um, cold conditions they had to sleep in, the, the work they had to do. And then you see there, it's a picture of Nelson Mandela's um, actual uh, prison. That was where he slept. Those are his belongings. This is the larger rooms. So I suppose Mandela was a lot more dangerous. He needed to be separated. But these were the larger rooms where the gentleman who was speaking to us, that's where he slept. He shared how many people were in a room and I counted the beds. There is definitely double the amount of people than available beds in there. So um, I couldn't even imagine it was quite a cold day to have to sleep, sleep there. Um, I do wanna share it was very exciting getting on the boat and going on this bumpy ride over there. There was a video going on in the boat. People were ch talking, lots of chatter. And then as we were coming back, it was very quiet on the boat. There's this eeriness to walk through those grounds and come back with that feeling um, that you walked through that place where everybody was imprisoned, really for no good reason. I'll bring you back to the animals. I also want to give a shout out, not just to the animals, I'm an animal lover, um, but also our, our guides. So the folks that took us out onto the ocean to see the sharks, 
couple of them were marine biologists. This was their life's work. You know, you have to, I, I was worried, what kind of a place are we gonna go? How do they treat the animals? Is this, is this a nice place to put your money? Um, but the money goes to take care of the animals again. Even our guides at the safaris, they all had degrees in environmental sciences, in conservation. They really cared. They lived with the animals. They were really about taking care of the animals. And it's weird to, to drive through and see slums and see really bad neighborhoods, to see all this trash, to, to hear your driver speak ill about another group of people, and then to get onto a safari ride and have such devotion towards nature, towards animal. There's, there's this hostility, hostility and, and hate, and then there's this great love and care, um, and you just can experience all of that in the same day, maybe even on the same ride. But also where you see all of those penguins, if you turn a little bit to the right, you could see all of these mansions. So somehow that exists. It exists in a way where you can have development and you have people living and then you can have a preserved area in which you're taking care of these animals that you care for. And then driving through, it was striking because the driver would say, oh, now this is where all the Germans live, you know? And, and this very apparent segregation that was um, startling to me, like, oh, so you have to be German to live here, but very normal, you know, as you go through the neighborhoods. And that is the southernmost peak of, of Africa. You got to be careful of the apes there and the monkeys. On that road, we had a baboon just flying out at us. They will come, steal your food, break into your car, take your stuff. There was a sign I read near Cougar that said, do not feed the monkeys because you will let them know that they are alpha. They will come back for food. And if you don't give them food, they will beat you up. So um, it, it's not a glorified zoo. You're not going over there and they're not named animals. You're not interacting or feeding. Uh, you're not petting. It really is like you, when, when I was younger, we watched animal programs all the time with my grandmother, bless you. Um, and it just felt like I flew to another country or another world almost and visited this reality of my childhood. And then now I get to go, come back home. I can't imagine that that exists on the same planet, um, but I'm really happy that it does. They really were just the cutest things. I had to throw extras of them. Look at the dad taking care of the babies. Just flop. And you walk around and you're just amongst them. It's, it's remarkable. And there's security everywhere. You know, making sure you don't get too close to the animals, that they're protected, that poachers are not around. I will leave some of the animals to you because your photos are amazing. Baboons sound scary, don't they? <laughs> Well, let's talk about this little gentleman on the left. This was on a morning drive, and... One of my favorite parts of the trip, frankly, was the safaris. I loved being out there with the animals and getting to see them. So this little gentleman on the left who looks so innocent, we stopped to have a morning breakfast in the national park that was there. And then he let out this sound, which we then all turned. And what we did not realize when he let out this sound, which was a very interesting one, and somehow he knew we would all turn. It's like this has happened before. Three of his friends came from the other side, attacked our picnic table, and ran away with sandwiches, with hard-boiled eggs. One person reached and he threw the hard-boiled egg, the bags of peanuts, etc. They look innocent. Looks can be deceiving. Uh, maybe the animals that we saw the most when we were out there were the giraffes. And I can't remember whether there's one image, but they were everywhere and loved seeing them. Next slide. There we go. And they were everywhere. There's something about being this. Now, when we're taking these pictures, I have to tell you, it was a wonderful experience because we're in open air Jeeps and there's eight of us. And there is nothing separating us from the animals, which was great 
for getting some of these pictures. I will tell you, however, that I, d I do have an eye watch that measures my steps, and a lot of people with this were Fitbits. So we weren't walking very much at all. But I do remember one morning that we went out for a three-hour drive. At the end of that three-hour drive, I had 14,000 steps. Why? because everywhere we were going, we were bouncing so much that every single bounce registered as a step. So I really felt like I was getting exercised and needing a chiropractor when I got back. The rhinos, one of the things, and Silva talks about the love that this community has for its animals. Everywhere we went, we saw signs about protecting the rhinos. When we were at the Indian Ocean and we went to a beach there, there was an artist who had made this amazing sand sculpture that was probably about 30 feet wide and about eight feet tall of rhinos and asking for donations for the conservation of the rhinos. Now, I took a lot of pictures of rhinos, but one of the things that the guide emphasized that was so important is no matter what you do, do not geotag these pictures. And the reason they were saying that is poachers would go online and look for the pictures that tourists posted and look at the geotags so that they would then be able to later go and hunt these rhinos. So there, this emphasis on making sure that we are protecting the animals was everywhere we went. And this was mother and child. It's amazing. This is a very young rhino about the size of a Jeep. <laughs> and glorious to be out there with them and watching it. These were three of my favorite portraits. Zebra everywhere. And obviously they talked about the fact that every single one of them, the markings on them were so different. Lions, we went lion hunting, but not in the way that you just signaled by your reaction, <laughs> with cameras. You would think lions are everywhere in South Africa. And we paid extra to go on a lion excursion because the game reserve that we were on did not have a lot of large predators. The only large predators there were cheetahs and one leopard that would occasionally pop in every now and then. So we had to go to another reserve to look for lions. And we paid a great deal of money, essentially 350 bucks a piece to go to this. And we went out one day and for five hours the guides were driving us around and we could not find a single lion. Dang it. I might have complained about that because everybody else that went out got really close to lions. In fact, some of these people went back and were like, look, they were mating in front of us for a half an hour. Here's my video. And I went, that is not a video I want to watch for half an hour. <laughs> but they got to go. So we went out again. And this time, instead of one of the guides taking us out, it was the supervisor that took us out. And he basically put us in the Jeep and said, we are not stopping for any animals, no matter what. You were out here to see lions. And eventually we came across this group of lions and it was a pride of lions with one large male, four females, two of which were out hunting apparently while we were there, and four cubs. And, they, and there was something about seeing lions. He's so cute, right? Well, the male was there and so were the females. How far away? He was about eight feet away from the Jeep. The large lions were no more than 10 to 12 feet from the Jeep. Why do I point that out? Remember, we're in an open air Jeep. So I'm sitting in the back row because I went, okay, that's the most elevated seat. That's the thing. And I went, all of a sudden I'm sitting there with my son right next to me and we're like, huh, they could jump up and, with n and there is nothing to stop them from doing that. So there was, a, there was a sense of, oh my gosh, you have to be in awe of what you're around and very careful. This elephant was actually at an elephant reserve that we went to and I know you got to go to it as well and they told us in the interesting stories what happened was in another part of Africa elephants actually can become overpopulated in some areas so they told us the story of the culling of certain packs of elephants and it was fascinating to me they said we culling obviously means taking away and killing the elephant but they said what you can't do is you just can't kill a couple if you're going to kill some, the elephants have such a tight-knit community and they mourn so much over the loss of other members of their pack, I don't know if it's called a pack, but their pack, that when they take a group of elephants, they have to take the entire group. And there were two, a young juvenile male and a juvenile female that were away when they called this pack of elephants. And then they came back 
and they were so sad and mourning. And the people that had done the culling said, we can't do that to these two. So they took them and they brought them to another reserve. Now the problem was they were then raised with these individuals and they tried to move them again and they got very upset. One of the, they told the story that one of the people that took care of them moved away to go to another camp and the elephant still went to his door every single morning looking for him for months and when he didn't come back, they started tearing up the plumbing and the irrigation and essentially rebelling because th their people were gone. So eventually they moved them to this reserve and there's now this, an adult male and an adult female and they have a child. This is the adult female that you see here. And they have handlers that go around with them. Now, there are also large predators on this reserve where they are kept. But the people that are with them, it's just two gentlemen and they have a little stick and they go out with no weapons, no form of defense because they said it doesn't matter if lions come, they are a part of the pack and the elephants will chase the lions away to keep their people safe because the people are part of their family. Oh, let me go back. Um, another family of elephants, these were coming down for a watering hole, and it was, it was just fascinating to watch them. This is back at that reserve. I keep saying that I'm, I am going with, I went with my 10-year-old. Next slide. There he is. We got to feed the elephants. Only, he was so far, he's, they're amazing how tall they are. I literally had to pick up my son who had a fistful of food and lift him up into the elephant's mouth. And he came down and his entire arm is, is dripping with elephant saliva. And he thought it was the, the greatest thing ever. And he goes, Daddy, what had happened if the elephant had closed his mouth? And I went, your head would have popped off, but it would have been okay. <laughs> but he was up in there. Next slide. There we go. Oh, and now let's go back. My favorite animal, the cheetah. We went to another cat rehabilitation center. And cheetahs were the highlight, although there was servals there. There was, there's was actually African, they're not house cats, they're wild cats, but they look like big house cats that they have there. Um, and a variety of different things. The serval was great. The serval loved my son, started cozying up to him as though he was a house cat and just petting him. And he thought that was his second favorite part of the trip after the elephants. The cheetah was one of my favorites. These cheetahs, they had cheetahs that they were gonna be for a part of a breeding program. Unfortunately, the, the two, male cheetahs that they were going to use and this is one of them he's asleep i did not kill him <laughs> um they ended up being sterile so now they've just kept as ambassadors to teach people about what the cats are like however one morning on safari it, we were out at six o'clock in the morning we came across this moment and this was a cheetah that had just eaten cat and killed a gazelle and it looks kind of pregnant in this this image that you see here nope that's just gazelle he said they eat about once every seven to 10 days. And when he, when he got up and walked away, he definitely wasn't pregnant, it was a boy. And when he got up and walked away, he was engorged. How far away was he? He didn't care about us. He was so used to seeing these Jeeps. That's maybe eight feet away from us. And he just sat there and yeah, he likes ribs too. We could hear him crunching through them as he was devouring this animal. And as some of you are like, ah, and it's like circle of life. Come on, Elton John song, Lion King. And we might've even sang that in the Jeep because you know, dad jokes. Oh, here was daddy lion that I was saying earlier. And when you see that and you're in the open air Jeep, that was that moment that I had of like, huh, I don't know what to do here. More of the, of daddy's offsprings, these cubs, just incredibly. And they look so sweet, but their paws, or about this big around, you're like, someday, <laughs> that is going to take down a wildebeest. <laughs> there was mom hanging out there. That shows you how much mom cared about the Jeep. Now, we did not come across them on the side of the road. Our guide, because remember, we had to go back that second time, literally went off the road, up a hill, between trees, got a lot of steps on that trip to get to where they were just up at the top of the hill, kind of surveying their domain. Oh. Elephants. Elephants were fascinating. These were two juvenile elephants. So we were parked on the side of the road by the river. Same river where you saw that group of elephants coming down earlier. And I know I'm anthropomorphizing when I say this, but they were playing. They were, they were wrestling around in the river, 
like any teenage group that you've ever seen in a pool. Now, how do I know, how am I, you know, ascribing these human-like qualities to them? Because as these two were kind of wrestling with one another, another one came up behind the one on the left and dunked it. Literally jumped, dunked him underwater. The trunk went up and he trumpeted and then started backing away and splashing. I am ascribing these human-like qualities because it was just like kids playing in a pool. But then this moment happened that once again reminds you how insignificant you are there. Because we were on the road watching this. And behind us, and we were all laughing, we hear a tree snapped in half. Why? Parent elephants were behind us. And one of them with its trunk literally snapped a tree in half. And we had that moment of like, wait a second. We're between the parents and their children. And our guide immediately started up the Jeep and just took off advisably because later on in the day, we saw an elephant that did not like one of the Jeeps and began to charge it. Now you're like, oh. But one of the things that we learned from the guide is they do give you a warning. First, they flap their ears and that's good. And if not, they make a false charge. If you cannot get your Jeep started by then, or in the case of the Jeep that we saw, had another one that was taking pictures behind it and did not want to get out of the way, then they will charge for real. So that Jeep not only backed around, it went down into a ditch, back up and around, because the elephants were not playing and it would have taken out that car. This was on the top of a hillside. The sunsets there are absolutely amazing. I have one more image. No, that was, that was the... It, it, it ends with the sunset. Did you want to add anything before our I final comments? I did want to add that you know how large an elephant is, but it is, when you see them pull an entire tree out of the ground, turn it over and just eat the parts they want and then walk off, you don't really realize how strong the trunk can be and how destructive they also can be. Because I kept saying, where are the elephants? And the guy was like, oh, not those elephants. You know, it just, and then there was this formula too, I asked. I said, well, how do you know how many elephants you're supposed to have? And they take the acreage of any game, and then they take how much foliage you could have and the type of foliage, how many trees, how many certain types of plants, and then how many animals that require those type of plants to live there and then the predators then get to be introduced to eat those animals. And so there's a whole calculation. And unfortunately, the elephants can be very destructive as much as they're my favorite. And they'll have to be removed and taken over to other reservations. And that's why the emphasis on, on having to kill an entire pack of elephant, as, as sad as it is. But there's this whole formula in making sure that they can maintain the safaris because there just isn't enough land for all of these animals. And I will add the other nice thing about the elephants, that ham there is warthog. And we ate quite a bit of that and quite a bit of gazelle. So as you said, the food is amazing. As an omnivore who loves to eat anything and thinks the cuter the animal, the better it tastes, Africa was also a wonderful trip. It was exotic in so many ways and so different than anything that we would experience here. But at the same time, my biggest takeaway in having experienced this foreign land through the eyes of my child is also how many similarities there are and how much we can learn from the mistakes that have been made in South Africa and not to make those same mistakes that Trevor Noah talks about in his book here. Thank you. Thank you.